Broadcasting live and worldwide. Here's Brody Brazil. Well, maybe a day late, but I suppose better late than never. You could say here on the last day of September 2020 that the playoffs officially began for the Oakland A's. Didn't really feel like Game 1 they were even in that contest against the White Sox. They lost 4-1. Lucas Giolito was awesome. Total role reversal today on a Wednesday at the Coliseum is the A's beat Chicago 5-3. They score the first five. Yeah, the end of the game got a little bit more interesting than anybody wanted. But when the dust all settled, a six-game playoff losing streak ends for the green and gold. And that is a good feeling. Again, it really did feel like a tale of two different games. The beginning for Oakland was great. Bassett was great. Run support was great. In the end, it got interesting. And obviously, Oakland is just happy to escape this. Liam Hendricks might have thrown more pitches than anybody anticipated or wanted. But I suppose the good news is he'll probably be available if necessary to shut down the game and the series, hopefully on tomorrow, Thursday. So the other bottom line is this, a clean slate, big picture in this series. Yeah, it was rough to drop the opener. In a short series, winning game one gives you so much of an edge, so much of an advantage. Oakland had their backs against the wall today. Now both teams are going to be facing elimination tomorrow. Kind of makes you wonder if the A's actually have more momentum based on how the White Sox might be feeling headed into game three. They did look quite frustrated as game two drug on. So let's get to Oakland's early offense, which I thought was one of the biggest factors of the day. Uh, Three hits in their first inning that matched their entire hit total of game one. That's absolutely crazy, but they got two runs in the first. They capitalized on that Nick Madrigal E4. Uh, Two runs there off the bat of Matt Olson. Two more runs in the second when Semyon homered. You just knew that if Oakland could get some early runs, it would really change the mentality for this team not only in this series, but also for Chris Bassett, knowing he was going to get some run support, knowing his effort was going to be meaningful and and have some meaning because some runs were being scored behind it. And speaking of Bassett, man, I said this before and I want to repeat it again. You couldn't pick a more perfect guy for this role of Game 2. And Game 2 in a best of three, that is a unique situation because you're pretty much getting the start under one of two circumstances, up 1-0 and you need to guy you need to be the guy to um you know put to put the dagger in or you're down 0-1 and you need to be the person to absolutely assure victory and keep this series going not just that but against his former team it's amazing it's been 2014 it's been what 6 7 almost 7 years since uh, Bassett was was traded over from Chicago he and Marcus Semien as well as Josh Fegley it's uh it's a it's a personality characteristic of Bassett to harbor that chip on his shoulder. And I love it because I think that's actually helped him succeed in recent years, going through that, also going through the Tommy John injury and surgery. But again, just all these different things going on for Bassett, um, the situation, who he was facing, and he thrived in the moment. His curveball was great, his location was sharp. 92 pitches got him through seven innings. He only allowed one run in his final frame. And even for Bassett in more recent times, it was just awesome to see him pick up where he left off in September, but really continue and finish a monster September, a calendar month where he allowed only two earned runs. That is amazing. Also offensively, I talked about the homer by Marcus Semien. Should also bring up the solo shot by Chris Davis. And not to you know, pair these guys up in this way, but they've both kind of struggled here offensively, maybe been in offensive ruts in recent times. And for KD, it's been longer. We know Marcus was dealing with the rib cage injury uh, late in the season, had to miss a couple games. That was a, that was a rare instance for Marcus. He's been playing through it. We obviously know that, but just like I said, the, the commonality is the struggle, but to see both these guys come through in the clutch with the long ball, kind of put the team on their back. Uh, just awesome moments. And by the way, specifically the moment for Marcus Semien, I want to point this out, uh, him pointing to his family up in the skyboxes of Mount Davis. I thought that was so cool that the broadcast captured it. Um, fans are not allowed to attend these games, but families of players are. 
secluded in luxury boxes, in this case out in center field um, in Mount Davis. And um, I, I posted a picture of his family's reaction uh, to that point. It was just so cool, so um, so sweet, you know, for Marcus to in the moment realize he was going to send a message to his family, the rare opportunity they get to see him play baseball in 2020 in the most important of times. Um, I thought that was so cool for Marcus to point up there. So long balls were, were critical. Mark Canna's catch in left field, top of the third to Rob Yuan Moncada. Awesome as well. Two runners on, no outs. Yeah, the A's already had a 4 nothing lead, but this could have opened the door if Chicago got one or two runs. Um, this could have opened the door for them to get back in this game, but it helped It helped at that point Bassett um, maintain the shutout he had and just canna up against the fence. He wasn't necessarily robbing a home run, but if he didn't make that catch, I think the ball goes off the wall, goes into left center field, and again, at least one run was scoring, potentially two, and would have been a different game at that point. So look, I'm recording this moments after the completion of Game 2. Well, our post-game show just ended, but at this point, I have no clue who is the Game 3 starter. Uh, and I have some ideas. First off, could it be a surprise? <laughs> I hope not. Um, but could it be Frankie Montas? I think that's that's a name. We, we can do this maybe by process of elimination. I don't think it will be Frankie Montas based on the fact that he just pitched Sunday. Uh, had a had a lengthy start. I want to say 113 pitches, if I'm recalling it correctly. Um, but maybe the righty in Montas would be available in some way, shape, or form. I do feel like he would be available if necessary. But that brings me to the two other obvious choices. And it's not to disrespect Mike Miner, um, but the A's, I think, have a little bit more track record with these two other choices, beginning with the righty, Mike Fires. Now, the right-handed pitching aspect is part of this. It's been well documented that the White Sox didn't lose any of their games against a left-handed starter in 2020, including the game that Jesus Lazardo just threw in game one yesterday of this series. So um, it's that combined with the fact that the A's do well when Fires starts. Oakland, um, of their 11 starts or 11 games that, that Fires started in 2020, uh, Oakland won eight of those. Eight of the 11 times Fires took the hill. His team won. Regardless of what his result was, his team won the game. I think that says a lot. But I also want to throw this out there. I could see the A's turning to Sean Manaya as well. Yeah, there's the whole left-handed thing, but he's pitched well lately. And also this. I mean, I know the result didn't work out last year, especially in that wild card game. But they've turned to him before in this scenario. They've seen things in him before. And I wonder if this would be the opportunity for redemption. So again, a lot to be figured out there. I know there's a lot of opinions out there. I'm as interested as you are to see what the A's do here with this choice. And I, and again, I, I also wonder if what they learned from Lazardo's experience in game one, how that factors into picking a starter for game three. All I know is this, you do not want to play into Chicago's home runs. They've scored seven runs so far in this series, six of them have come on homers. And even today late, when they needed runs, they turned to the long ball. I just think that is that is a key factor for anybody who gets this opportunity to start. Uh, some other keys for Oakland on Thursday, I think mentally, although it's going to be impossible to think of it this way, you really do have to approach it like any other baseball game. Fortunately, it's in your stadium. Fortunately, you're the one coming off a win. But yeah, whoever loses is done for 2020. Secondly, I hope the A's bats can keep their thing going. Um, the seven hits they recorded today was more prototypical of where they've been recently. And that could and should give you the four or five runs they might need to win tomorrow's game. This is playoff baseball. You're usually not going to see a track meet uh, in terms of the scoreboard. So again, if they can keep the offense consistent, I think everything's going to going to shake out well. And on that last note here, my, my third key is just be sharp defensively and all the little things. Oakland's been doing that so far. The White Sox didn't today, and you could kind of see how it cost them. So again, there is a lot going on here and a lot to be excited about, a lot to be nervous about. Uh, there's a little bit of fear to have. There's a lot of hope to have. And all of it's going to be realized on the very first day of October 2020. So I cannot wait to see you then. Our pregame coverage is at 1130 
on NBC Sports California. So try and get some sleep, try and relax. It's going to be a busy Thursday in the town.